Hey, James, what's going on, man? Thanks so much for taking out the time to chat with me. Um, so I kind of want to get you on just because uh, you got a lot of experience in real estate and I want to dive into that. Um, before we kind of do, can you give some people the background about you and who you are? Yeah, uh, my name is James Aduna. I'm a, I'm a real estate investor, um, but I'm also have a W-2. I'm in uh, biotech sales, focusing on tissue regeneration. And uh, I cover the San Francisco, uh, well, I used to cover the San Francisco market, but I moved down to uh, Southern California. And I cover uh, from Long Beach all the way up to Santa Barbara. Um, I primarily work with surgeons in uh, plastic surgery, uh, vascular surgeons, as well as uh, surgical oncology, uh, regenerating, you know, uh, chronic wounds with, with my products. So that's primarily what I do. That's my nine to five. But my passion is really real estate. And certainly we can get into that too, Peter. Yeah. Um, how... Like, so as you're working your W-2, at what point did you say like, hey, I, sh I want to get into real estate and, and start doing that on the side? Um, and what was that conversation like? Yeah, you know, I, I guess the best way to answer that was is really to just give you, you know, some of my failures, right? Because I've always had, you know, a, a passion for real estate. I just didn't know how to... I didn't know how to figure it out. Like I, I, I knew the basis of real estate and, and a lot of people created wealth, but I didn't understand the numbers at that time. I just wanted to jump in. So I would say back in 2007, right, is when I first got into it. I was in technology sales in San Francisco Bay Area. And um, I purchased my first property. I was doing well there. You know, I just exited from a startup. And I wanted to take my money instead of going on a, a trip with my my friends to Europe. I put it on the, a condominium in the Berkeley Hills, and um, didn't know much about it. And as we all know, you know what happened during that time. You know, shortly thereafter, I got myself into a condo, uh, which way over my head, and I also got in a business deal with my cousin at that time. Um, and what we did, I learned so much from this, but what we did was we entitled 70 acres down in, in Palmdale, uh, California, took it from agriculture to commercial. In six months, I had it sold to one of the largest developers, uh, which is Opus West at that time, industrial developers. Um, but we got greedy, right? They, they wanted to cut down you know, a small percentage of the price. We wouldn't budge. That's when the market fell. Mm -hmm. So imagine this, like, uh, you know, I'm still a young buck back then. And I put all my life savings into that, both yeah. the condominium and the, uh, the land deal, right. Which is the entitlement deal. But I, I learned a ton. You know, the one thing I, I learned there is always have reserves. I didn't have really, I probably had a month's reserve at that time. So that's why I lost the condo. And mm -hmm. I put all my money into that you know, that real estate deal with my cousin. Um, but I also got greedy, right? So yeah. I had so many lessons at that time that now I'm just more of a more responsible and more mature investor. So, gotcha. but I don't think I could have came to this point in my investing career if I didn't go through that heartache. For sure. Yep. So going through that and then pushing through... 2008, 9, 10, what did that kind of look for you and look like for you? I mean, like, um, were you after that whole, you know, you lost the condo and everything else, like, what did it look like? Yeah. So basically it's, it's just like a lot of tales. I'm sure you hear from a lot of entrepreneurs. So after that, my credit was shot. Right. So, you know, I, I had to do a short sale. Right. So literally and my all my credit cards too were you know i i was that's what i was living on right yeah. so it took me about eight years to to make all that back during that eight years i couldn't do anything so mm -hmm. all i ended up doing was saving and saving and saving and saving um until roughly i would say 2016 is when i started getting into uh, investing, like the investing, how I invest now, right? I started investing into single family homes in the Memphis area, right? And I got involved in turnkey assets, but it took me two years to research 
where I wanted to invest first because I didn't want to go through that same debacle again, right? Yeah. And what I found out during the 2008 crash, Memphis only lost about 5% of its value, right? You know, and in most of the markets in the United States, as you know, being a, a realtor, um, you know, you lost 55 or more percent in value. So yeah. I'm like, okay, this makes a lot more sense. Like invest here, even though if the market in the pop, the rug gets pulled out, you still have a leg to stand on, right? Mm -hmm. And the big, you know, the big disparity between investing in startups or investing in the market, meeting Wall Street, is that, you know, I knew like all, I lost all, a lot of assets during that time too, but I knew if I held the title to my investment and the market crashes and I still have a renter, well, I don't lose that asset. Yeah. Right? So, so that's when I like went full on and focused on uh, turnkey assets. And then from turnkey assets, I learned how to burr. And, you know, for those, you know, you listening right now, you know, burring is just like buy, rent, rehab and repeat. Right. So, and that's what I ended up doing for two or three years. I just started, yeah. went from turnkey to burring single family homes to doing some flips myself uh, until I found out after, you know, um, partnering with another investor through GoBundance, the same group that we belong to, Peter, um, I started going for bigger deals with less leverage, but more who's not how's, right? Mm -hmm. um, and now I'm investing in multifamily and mobile home parks. Gotcha. Okay. And what, um since you jumped back in you know 2016 ish um and you know spent the time to do the due diligence um what were some things that you know over the course of you know that eight years that you kind of put down as a a pavement to get back up to you know getting into buying properties and everything else like because obviously there's there's some confidence that need to be built to to get back into it as you know, as you build up everything else, credit and all that, um, how are you able to do that? Like, cause some people, you know, they have one house and it gets wiped out. Right. And then all of a sudden they're never in the game again, but you mm -hmm. at least had the ability to see where your shortcomings were in that era and then rebuild and then be way better the next time. Yeah, wow. You know, you're asking really some great questions because I think a lot of your listeners, um, you know, need to hear this, right? For, it, it's not always roses, but I think really to answer that question, you, you really have to work on your mindset, right? Because I had so many li limiting beliefs, especially after that happened, like I'm not good enough. There's no way I'm going to learn this. So what I ended up doing was I ended up going to a Tony Robbins event, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I did UPW, you know, Unleash the Power Within, down in Los Angeles. I literally spent, I think it was thirty five hundred to do mm -hmm. that to be, and I and I learned this like quickly to be around a room of guys who are 10, 20, you know, years ahead of you, but 20, 10, 20 years success more successful than you. And for those of you who haven't been in a Tony Robbins event, you know, so there's there's different tiers to be in the event, right? There's, you know, um, general admission, there's VIP, there's, I forgot the other one, but I paid to go to platinum. And I yeah. literally, that was like, like so much money for me at that time. Yeah. But I figured out, I'm like, if, if, if I go to this event and I'm sitting with guys just like me, yeah, I'll gain something out of it. But if I go into the event and I'm sitting literally next to Oprah Winfrey, um, you know, the, uh, the guys that just won an uh, NBA championship at that time, I think it was the Detroit Pistons coach was there, Rick Carlisle, um, uh, the Gracie fam, literally these guys were like, nice. just steps away from you. I had Victoria's secret models, which I would have paid like nothing to be right next to them. But I, <laughs> I mean, all, like who's who, and I yeah. didn't know this unbeknownst to me, I didn't even know these people were like, were sitting in the same section that I was, but I sat there for three days sucking that all in usher is like three rows down and i'm like okay i'm in the right space yeah. but literally i was brainwashed in a good way during that event and my trajectory not only after that event i became the, the, the top salesman in the whole country for my company at that time 
Nice, um, Tony, yeah, Tony Robbins interviewed me. They heard my story. I'm not, it's probably somewhere in that the stratosphere right now yeah. with like interviews and stuff. And, you know, um, but it's, it gets back to it's who you're hanging your, yourself around. You know, it's whether, you, whether you're hanging out with a guy who's broke or whether you're hanging out with a guy that is a multimillionaire, you, you have to choose correctly, especially in that time of your life. Um, so that's what I did. I did that and I did date with destiny. And I think I went from like, just having a normal life to like, just thinking differently, acting differently. And, you know, and along the same way, I, I'm, I was helping people too, because before that I was very selfish. It was all about me. Right. Mm -hmm. And I figured out like the more people you help, the actually more successful you become. Yeah. And that transcends <laughs> in your life. Right. And like yeah. what you're doing right now with this podcast, the more people you help, the more successful you become. I, you know, I know you're a real successful guy already, but you know what I mean? It's just, it just transcends from there. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, I think that's pivotal for, you know, other people and yourself, especially in that, that scenario, right? Like, you know, going back to what I, I mentioned before, um, you, there's some people that just take that and take it as that, you know, the L that it is. And then they, they never get back up and they're just like, Hey, I'm, you know, I'm going to rent for the rest of my life. Um, and not saying that that's bad, but at the same time, like you want that progression to get to another place, to be in another place because you want to build yourself up throughout your life versus, you know, just staying, you know, in a plateau. Um, so it's inspiring, especially to, to hear you say, even though you didn't have that much money to, you know, go to the afterwards and, and be inspired, which a lot of people were like, you know, why am I spending $3,500? But that's not the mindset to have. It's like, you know, that 3,500 is going to, you know, make you 350,000, you know, along the way and more. And having that abundance mindset puts you in really a different, you know, bracket um, as an individual and a, you know, thought, you know, thought leader really um, for you, you know, going there and then moving forward, was it, okay, well, I'm going to put together, you know, a, a business plan or I'm going to put together a plan of attack because it sounds like from there you, you started picking a market and you were going to push into a market um, and get into a good market where you're not going to lose, you know, big and you're going to do the data and the research to be successful versus just shooting from the hip. Correct. Correct. Yeah, it took me literally uh, two years to pick Memphis as an investment yeah. um, because of, of course, of, of the, the, you know, the things that happened prior to that. Um, but yeah, to your point, you know, Peter, I, that event, you know, UPW allowed me to to set a, a, a goal, right, but an outline really for how I wanted to you know, control my life at that point. Because before I was just, I was, like you said, shooting from the hip and letting life dictate how I react to it versus me reacting to how life is going to react to me because of this choices I'm making, right? Yeah. So, yeah, so I did some, I, yeah, really the data that I, 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 you know, I wrote down, I think is like a lot of smart investors, you know, where are the jobs going? What is the market growth looking like, right? What is, you know, what was the, the demographic, what's the type of demographics I wanted to look after? For me, it was yeah. blue collar workers, right? Because there's a there's a, a good amount of blue collar workers, unfortunately, that either don't want to own their homes or can't afford to own homes, but they want to have a safe place, you know, a clean place to live with, you know, with their families. And a lot of them are very responsible, right? And that's what I wanted to do is just focus on the, you know, the, the people that, are really you know the heartbeat of america so to speak and yeah. that's what i did yeah i mean what if you were to quantify if you had like one thing to look at in a market um to tailor i know you look at a lot of different things but if it was like one thing that um someone said james the only thing that you could see is a data point that you could pick a good market what would it be would it be you know job growth population growth would it be you know business um what's one good thing? Granted, it's a, a whole sphere of things, but what's one good thing that you can think off the top of your head that would be a good, you know, starting point for people to look at? Yeah, really for, for me, since I was looking at the blue collar market is really what type of um, companies cater 
to that demographic, right? That's starting to move into that area. And, and what I mean by that, you know, is like Amazon was one of the companies I was looking, okay. I was keying on Amazon fulfillment centers. So yeah. I followed that the first three years, I mm. followed where Amazon fulfillment centers were opening. Right. Oh, okay. Right. And then I also followed like FedEx, right? FedEx, that's where the world hub is. Yeah. Is, is Memphis, Tennessee. And I knew that there's going to be a lot of blue collar work at that time. So no one's going to lose jobs for FedEx and Amazon to implode, you know, simultaneously. That's, that's not well. going to happen. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah. So, so I knew that that trend was going to happen. I didn't think it was going to be this crazy. Like literally, you know, I, I doubled, you know, my money out there, you know, since I've invested, I didn't think yeah. it was going to be that substantial, but then you throw in, you know, a great healthcare system as well. So yeah. Memphis has a great health healthcare system too, that has nurses, has physicians, obviously physicians is more white collar, but nur nurses, you can kind of teeter to, you know, blue collar work as well. Uh, but everything to service those industries, yeah. healthcare, fulfillment centers, right? A airports. So, yeah. and ironically, those are most of my renters are, you know, are those people that support those industries. Yeah, that's huge. Um, I mean, because I've heard, you know, a lot of stories of people just going for, you know, let's say one, one income or, you know, one employer in that area. And then they just get decimated, you know, because um, that employer goes out of business, you know, maybe it's a, you know, a couple billion dollar company, but then, you know, the market shifts and it goes away from them. Technology comes into play more so than it was or something like that. And then, you know, they have no rental, you know, no people within 30, 40 miles that want to rent the place because, you know, everything's moved out. So I think that, I mean, that's a huge indicator and that's a lead in, in indicator, especially to jump in a specific market um, for, you know, you going from, you know, a couple of deals back in 07 to being able to scale uh, where you're at now, what would you say would be um, what you, what are things you've learned to be able to scale now, right? Because you have, you know, a bunch of units. Um, what, what type of things did you have to change to get in that mindset? Yeah, no, that's a good question. I, I think really, um, Number one, I think for me, you know, it may not work for everyone. Uh, I brought a partner in, right? Huh. And it, I brought the who, not the how, right? Because I knew the how, I was doing it myself. Yeah. But by bringing in a partner who, who was doing more of, uh, you know, the back office stuff, which I, I don't like, right? Yeah. Particularly, I, I do it anyway, right? Like yeah, working yeah. on the deal, doing the performa, like, I don't mind doing that, but I feel like that's more of a chore, quite honestly. Like I understand that's that's a key, you know, aspect of the business. But yeah. for me, I like negotiating the deals. I like finding the deals. I like the relationships. I like to have those hard conversations with vendors. Those are the things that I enjoy. And you know, my partner Chris and I were, you know, it it, it works because he doesn't like to be in front of the you know front of the house, so to speak. He, yeah. he's fine being in the back of the house, right? Um, so that's key. Um, also, I think, you know, looking like looking three years ahead, five years ahead, um, I read that book, uh, Vivid Vision, mm -hmm. and writing out really what my vision is, both of us did that, um, and just following through to that vision, right? And, and really, um, really creating that um, accountability, I guess, with yourself and your partner to to really assess where you are on a monthly quarterly yearly basis based on that you know um that vision really because a lot of things you know those are the things that you have to do daily weekly to, uh, for me to measure my progress right yeah. now of course you have to have the fundamentals you have to understand you know your your numbers right you have to look at the demographics of the location you have to work well with your vendors have good relationship with your brokers but for me, the fundamentals of investing, you know, that's that's something that you need to to really uh, measure. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, yeah, you, you definitely have to measure it. You have to um, you have to really make sure, you know, come back to that vision to see how far you're off, you know, off course, uh, because you always hear those sayings like, you know, you don't 
you know, drive across country and not have a map, you know, not, not type it into Google maps or, you know, whatever you use to, to get from point A to point B. But um, you want to be able to make sure that you can review what your goals are and review what your vision is and then say, okay, am I tracking or should I, you know, adjust course to be able to get back on track? Um, so that's huge. Um, when now, like as you're growing more, how um how has it changed you know before you were you know smaller units um to get you know the cash flow coming and and coming in you know each month now you're going after bigger deals um how does that kind of look have you have you switched from you know fourplexes to you know multi-units to now mobile home parks what's that type of look like and that stuff look like yeah no um yeah, it's interesting. I think everybody goes through this. It's um, so I started out with single family homes. So right now, I mean, I think I have about 18 single family homes, right? Um, and those homes, it, it took me to, to really to break down the deal. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it took me about an hour to two hours just to do the numbers, right? Mm -hmm. To do the same thing with multifamily or mobile home parks, now I'm a lot more proficient at it, but it, it takes virtually the same time. Okay. Right? But you're dealing with multiple zeros. Yeah, yeah, in, yeah. In, in, in NOI. Right? Yeah. Versus you're you're dealing with just a single family home. So for me, it just clicked. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm doing the same amount of work for minimal, you know, the gain versus going all in on multifamily, you know, and I did have to go through tra to that trajectory. I did uh, duplexes, fourplexes, you know, then I did my first 14 unit deal um, to, to now mobile home parks. My last mobile home park, I think I was telling you the other day, I have no money down in it. So it's an infinity deal. Yeah. Right? So I think you, you just figure it out like there, and you figure out the different nuances of negotiating. Right. But having said that, you've got to put yourself in the same room as guys that are, you know, 10, 20 years ahead of you. Yeah. You know, so I think um, really having a game plan and putting yourself in a room with other guys that are performing in a higher level, um, I think is, is paramount to your growth. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, going back to the Tony Robbins thing, it's definitely, definitely like leveling up, being able to put yourself, you know, be vulnerable, put yourself in different areas, you know, and be able to, you know, capitalize on that stuff. Um, and, and don't hold back, you know, just go into something knowing that you may look like, you know, you're a beginner, but um, that beginner's mindset puts a lot of people in a position to win, you know, um, because you're open to learning anything and dive into anything. So, um, so when you're doing deal, um, analysis, are you doing it on spreadsheets? Um, I mean, I know that you've refined what you've done in the past. Are you now on spreadsheets? How are you running your deals and your numbers? Yeah, no, no. Good question. Um, so I, I've created all my own, you know, spreadsheets throughout the years, um, and compared it with, you know, different spreadsheets that are out there. But it's, it's, you know, your normal, you know, Excel spreadsheets. Um, it's, it's really hard to really say like the way, you know, yeah. a person should do it. But, you know, obviously you, you want to, you know, you want to just get the, the spreadsheet that works for you at that time. I've, I've, I've done my own Burr spreadsheets. Um, and I really just, I mix and match really from other investors, right? So, you know, if you get you know, lucky enough to just, you know, be in the same rooms with these other investors, you, you just compare notes, really. Mm -hmm. um, so like the spreadsheet we're doing now, you know, Chris and I, it's, you know, there's no way in hell I was going to do that type of spreadsheet back, you know, you know yeah. when I first started. It's too confusing. I'm like, yeah, what's yeah, yeah. CCR? What does that stand for? You know, what's the, what's NOI? You know, what's the three-year view, five-year view? Like, you, there's no way. Yeah. But I think through the process of learning, what works for you and what doesn't and by having conversations with other you know more experienced investors you can develop your own spreadsheets but i would also encourage you know your listeners to to pay for these courses and you'll understand what works for you what doesn't right yeah. um 
really, and based on, of course, the criteria that that you have, whether it's multifamily, whether it's mobile home parks, et cetera. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, I know it's not one size fits all. Um, everybody kind of does their stuff, you know, separate. And then, you know, it kind of comes into the same numbers to to kind of feel it out. Just like fix and flip, you know, you, you look at a, a property differently because, your ARV is probably maybe a couple bucks off. And then also your contractor may be, you know, 20% more than mine and vice versa. So um, all that stuff runs together to make sure that it's efficient and you make that, that profit that you're looking for. Um, so you're taking, you know, you're, you're doing partnerships now and you have your W2 um, for you, like, talking about vivid vision and having a goal set up, what are you kind of looking for in the next, you know, if I was to talk to you in two and a half, three years, what does that look like? Does that look like, you know, more mobile home parks? Does that look like, you know, more multifamily or, you know, a divergence of both? Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. It's interesting. You said I was just having that conversation with Chris I was driving back home. So, um, so the six to 12 month view, what we're doing is we're, we're focusing on, on mobile home parks and multifamily, right? Medium size, right? 50 to 100, right? They all have to have at least an equity gain of 300,000 or more, right? And double digit cash on cash returns. So 10% or more returns, or we're not going to look at it at all. Yeah. Right now we're taking all the properties that we've gained through the last three years. We're stabilizing that, right? Because there's honestly, we, we've grown so fast in the last three years that we're not focusing on the numbers and we really need to focus on the numbers to stabilize all these properties. Um, but I would say the next three years, you know, I would say another between the him and I, I would say about 300 or more spaces and units we'd like to have uh, in our portfolio from their transition into triple net. Uh, maybe light industrial to triple net, um, you know, um, commercial, small commercial centers. Yeah. Um, I think that's where the trend is for us. For me with a medical background, I also, am, and I'm, I'm also uh, very, I think I'm going to, I don't say I think I know I'll purchase a medical dental building, right? Mm -hmm. Triple net with cams. In yeah. It because I know that when's the last time you saw your doctor go out of business? Oh, dude. That your is, dentists go out of business. Yeah, when is the last time? Is, I, the only time I see them uh, go out is because they moved out of out of state or out of area. You know, that's the only time I see them like leave, and then right. then another dentist or doctor comes right in. Yeah, it, it, it's just a phenomenal, phenomenal, um, you know, industry to, to or sorry, um, a building to own because yeah. the industry is just so you know it's so predictable. So yeah, and and keep in mind all the TIs they're all done by the physicians right mm -hmm. so you don't pay anything out of pocket you're you're just you know acquiring the asset and holding on to the asset yeah so really that's the i think that's the next progress and i always wondered why people the older people get into triple net i understand now so the only thing that you have to watch out for is if like say you have a strip center and somebody leaves that's when you have to have at least a year's worth of reserves okay right so, but even then you can still negotiate that, right? I'm, I was just talking to another GoBro and I, I, he told me how he negotiated a whole year of reserves in yeah. the deal, so. Okay, well that's, I mean, that's nice. I, I think I've heard that before on Bigger Pockets, um, someone negotiating, you know, reserves in their, in their purchase, so. Um, okay, and so with that goal, um, are there other people that you're trying to get, you know, like get in the funnel for building that, you know, that uh, capital to get into those properties? Because obviously, you know, at that point, you know, it's not just you, um, you're bringing on more partners and stuff like that. How, how are you, how have you done that? Because you come from a background of doing it yourself, you know, um, how do you really build that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we, we recently talked about this now too. Like, so in our, in our group, you know, Peter and, and our GoBundance group, you know, there's people that are, are, are physicians, our attorneys or, or have their W2 high paying jobs. They don't have the time or really want have, want to create that time for themselves to get themselves involved in these deals and have these relationships that my partner and I have 
So they've been, you know, um, just coming up to us in various events and stuff and asking us how to get part of the deal. In the past, we've always just said it's him and I, right? So to your point, I think what we'll probably end up doing next year is bringing um, like probably one or two or three maybe uh, equity partners into the deal um, as purely, you know, equity partners. And if there's a certain aspect that they can bring into the um to the deal that's even more welcome, but we're not gonna do syndication models. We're just gonna strictly have a win-win relationship with the partners and have, you're having equity. What do you bring to the table? Okay, you bring, you know, you, you bring down the numbers, you bring this relationship in. So we have equal parts into the deal, but we're not gonna do a syndication uh, aspect. We're gonna do more of equity, true equity. So if it's, you know, let's just make it easy if we're purchasing a, a million dollar asset and, you know, there's four people in the deal, then we're going to carve that up, like, say, you know, 300,000 each or 250,000 in each in a deal. But we own the entire deal. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And equal parts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, with your track record and stuff like that, like uh, pitching something like that to outside of, you know, people that you know really well has how can you frame that to make you know, like make sure it's it's seamless have you thought about that yeah I, I think you know the guys that we're going to pitch really are the guys that are already investing right okay. we're, we're not going to we're not going to pitch people that are just kind of new to investing right that's what our syndications are for right yeah, so yeah. we're gonna we're really going to do the pitch to you know guys like you, like, you know, exactly what you're doing. So, you know, you can ask the right questions. We're not wasting each other's time. And you can see from my performa, really, what, where's the opportunities? Where's the risk, right? You guys, you know, you know us as individuals first mm -hmm. versus investors. Yeah. Um, and just, just make it easy, right? Um, yeah, we want to make be really cut and dry uh, about the investment. Just go through the, the performa, hear the risk, hear the rewards. Do you want to invest or not? So. Yeah. 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 Um, and then, you know, as, as you continue on with your W2, do you see yourself, you know, as you build up um, all this equity and everything else, do you, is there a plan to step away or is it, you know, you're going to finish out, you know, I'm not sure what retirement looks like for you on that, that front, but has that been a conversation? I'm sure it's been a conversation in your head. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it's a conversation all the time. Like, I, I really, truly do like what I'm doing, right? It's there's a lot of I feel like a lot of value and I get a lot of, you know, gratification at the end of the day, because I'm working with, with, with these patients, they're just challenging patients and these, you know, the physicians I work with, it's really an honor to work with these guys, because they're like, you know, they're really the the top tier in the industry. Yeah. Um, but that being said, I like my freedom more than that, right? Yeah. Because I think I can help more people by having the, you know, wealth more as a vehicle, right? Than than just having wealth just just to put away in a bank. I think it's really truly as the more I think the more successful you get, the true personality comes out. So if you're a jerk, you're going to be a jerk. If you, if you really want to help other people, you will want to help other people. And I think that's really my calling is helping other people, you know, including my family, my family first, then, you know, colleagues, et cetera. And really that's what I want to do in order to do that. Um, you know, I, for me, my goal is making over 50,000 a month right now. I make about 25, 30,000 a month in my, you know, W2. Mm -hmm. Once I hit that with my investing on, on my cash on cash monthly returns, I'll probably step away. Right. Um, so, I think once I do that, then I'll be comfortable enough to do that. Who knows? It might be different, you know, down yeah, the line. Sure. But I, I think having half of my goal would be would give me the opportunity and the the gumption to like take that. I wouldn't even say risk; it just take that next step of you know my investment career. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think too. It's uh, I think um you look at it as like okay well i got the w2 i can continue to like grind at that um but at some point kind of you alluded to it um at some point you get to a place where uh it's diminishing returns like you're you're pulling away from you know where you can ultimately gain value in that investing and then pulling on more you know more properties for one 
and then two more investors and continue. And that just snowballs just like it does like your life, you know, on certain things that you go attack and go after. It just snowballs and gets to a point where you're like, okay, well, this makes sense because I'm moving towards this, this, you know, monumental goal. Now I'm going to just exclude the things that are holding me back or not holding you back, but taking your time away from being more yeah. proficient at that. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. It's, it's time value of money after a while. Like in my, like what I could be doing here, like I'm sometimes in the room, you know, the surgery room for like two or three hours in a day. Yeah. Like literally I'm sitting there, like just sitting there, like yeah. maybe I'll talk for a, a couple of times, but that's it. Right. Yeah. So the time I can do that, I probably couldn't have negotiated a deal, broke the deal down and made an offer in three yeah. hours. Right. Um, and yeah, and so you have to really say like what the time value of money is at the, that point in your life. And, and as, as much as I love my, my W2, there's going to be a time that uh, I'm going to step away from it. And it's, beca and it's because it's really the time value of money than anything else. Yeah. And I mean, I think you're, I think you're there in the sense of, um, you know, your track and also, you know, the way you're going and also your track record, how you've been able to, you know, for one, go through what you went through in 07 and then rebuild um, and then rebuild better, right? Um, and smarter and faster and more efficient. Um, so I think that that for sure for you, um, you can put that, you know, behind you as, you know, a second work, you know, third workhorse where it's like, and confidence wise is what I mean is like consistently building on what you've done. Um, so I feel like, you know, you'd be even more successful at what you're doing now once you step away from, you know, W2. So, um, but I know you enjoy it. So, yeah. so um, what markets are you in right now? What are, like, is it anywhere and everywhere or? No, no, I'm it's very specific with where I'm in, right? So I'm in three markets right now. So Memphis, Tennessee is one. I'm in um, San Antonio, Texas. And I'm in Little Rock, Arkansas, okay. right? Um, and it's for the same reasons we talked about earlier in the podcast. It's it's because of those those key indicators for me, those key companies that are you know that I'm looking uh, that I know that are, are growing and they're going after that blue collar worker side. Yeah, 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 yeah for sure. No, that's good. Um, so we uh, there's like the last few questions. Um, so I'll transition a little bit. Um, at the end of it here, but um, is there, since you have so many systems, you're working a W2 and stuff like that, is there something that you use as an online resource or an app or something like that to make yourself, you know, you and Chris more efficient um, to either communicate or, you know, to run your deals or systematize what you have going on? Yeah, yeah, no, actually, we, yeah, we use Asana um, okay. to kind of systematize our, our, our calls and what's priority to us. Um, you know, me personally, I, I use the one sheet for my, my goals. Right. Yeah. Um, but I think everybody should have some sort of, you know, what are my goals for this year and what, what's more, you know, what's priority, what's less priority, but that's, you know, as you know, that's the one sheet that for us. Um, and then I also, uh, rent -a meter obviously oh, to yeah. do a, yeah, a quick check of, okay, you know, is this broker telling me to write, you know, is, is really, this is where the rents are. Yeah. Or, you know, because I can't, I don't really trust Zillow as much, right? Yeah. But I do trust rent, you know, Rentometer because that's kind of the, you know, year to date and what's happening six months, you know, 12 months from now in that little sphere. Um, so for me, if off the top of my head, yeah, Asana and Rentometer. Okay. Um, what about uh, a book that you've read, you know, recently or in the past that's that's helped you out? It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be uh, in the real estate, but just something that sticks out. Yeah. Well, gosh, uh, think and grow rich. You know, um, that's definitely a big book. Um, I think I would recommend everybody. You know, you know, everyone's going to say so anything with Kiyosaki. Uh, you know, obviously, that's yeah. going to be that. That's going to be key. But I think Vivid Vision for me has mm -hmm. helped me um, really um, take a step step up and leverage um you know what i needed to leverage at that time and i read that about two years ago um yeah so vivid vision it really gave me the compelling you know view of what i wanted in my life 
Yeah. Um, through this interview, I mean, like more of just a conversation that you and I would sure. have on the phone. Was there anything that, um, you know, we skipped over or something like that, that you think I should have asked or, you know, anything that you can think of that, you know, maybe would add value? Yeah. I mean, I, I think I'm trying to think it's, you've asked some really good questions there. Um, sure. You know, for me, if I was asking, if I was asking another successful person, like where, you know, how they achieve their, their goals, maybe, you know, what you already asked was what, what was the one mistake that you, you know, that you made that you learned from, but that's what you asked in the beginning. So, yeah. you know, I really wouldn't add anything else really at, at this point, because I think you've asked a lot of, you know, good questions, but for me, I like to learn from people's mistakes. So. Yeah. Um, you know, well, you know, that was a great, you know, position question you positioned in the beginning. Thanks, dude. Thanks. Well, um, James, dude, we'll get you out of here, but I really appreciate the conversation and, and especially hearing a little bit about you and, and honestly giving inspiration to, you know, people that maybe have lost out on a couple of deals or lost deals completely and lost some money. Um, you know, you were able to turn it around and be successful and be, you know, way more successful in investing, especially, um, after, you know, kind of losing some on one. So yeah, no, no, happy, happy to help, man. Cool, man. Well, I appreciate it, dude. All right. Take care, Peter. Thanks so much. Thanks, buddy.